Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for the privilege we have once again at this time. We're asking, Lord, that your word will be real to every heart tonight in Jesus' name. We're asking, O oh Lord, that the blessing contained in your promises will be ours, not only today, all through our lives and in our ministries in Jesus' name. Exalt the Lord Jesus Christ tonight. And Lord, we also pray that you lift him up so much that you'll be able to see what he has for us. And we pray, Lord, that you lift us up, up our faith in you so that we'll be all we need to be for the glory of the Lord. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Give me an amen like you have not gone to sleep. That is better. Can you say that again? God bless you. Tonight we're looking at Revelation chapter 3. And we're looking at verses 7 all through to, 11, all through to 13. I'm starting with verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, The thing says he that is holy, he that is true, he that has the key of David, that he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. We're looking at this church tonight, and we're looking at purity and perseverance of a faithful church. This church... The Lord Jesus Christ found it to be faithful and to be persevering as well as to be pure. This church in Philadelphia received commendation, praise, and encouragement without any blame, without any correction, and without any condemnation from Christ. And he that is true and holy did not see anything unclean, anything unholy, anything untrue in their midst. The righteous, impartial judge was so pleased with that church that all he had to say to them was that he would give them a privilege of further, greater, more usefulness in ministry. There are two churches among these seven. The church in Smyrna, and the church in Philadelphia, Christ commended them. He had no moral flaw to point out. There was no spiritual blemish or doctrinal error to correct. And therefore, that gives us encouragement. If there can be two churches out of the seven that Jesus looked at with his penetrating eyes like flames of fire, and yet he couldn't see anything unclean, any sin of a blemish of a blame, any sin of a spot, any sin of sin, hidden or open in their midst. What an encouragement, what a hope he gives to us that the church today can be pure, can be holy, can be righteous. Not only that, that the individual Christian, the possibility is there that we can have complete victory in the Lord, with the Lord, for the Lord, living every day, the victorious life, living a day at a time. As you think about the other churches who have studied, the church in Ephesus, the church in Pagamos, the church in Tatira, and the others who have Sisi, and the church in Sardis. And you come to this one, and you'll find that they compromise in other churches. You don't find in Smyrna, you don't find in Philadelphia. The corruption you find in the other churches, you don't find in Smyrna, you don't find in Philadelphia. The decline of the first love you find in other places, not in Smyrna, not in Philadelphia. The inroad of idolatry and immorality that came through the corrupting influence of Jezebel, you don't find in Philadelphia, not in Smyrna. The deception, the doctrinal deception. And the deeds of Balaam and the Nicolaitans that you find in other places that Jesus said, I hate it. And I don't want it. And it's unfortunate for you, church in Tatira, you permit this kind of thing in your midst. You don't find in Smyrna, you don't find in Philadelphia the association and interaction with false religious people of the world. No, you can't find that in Smyrna. You can't find it in, in Philadelphia. 
the tolerance of sin, tolerating sin, tolerating false prophets, the fear of suffering persecution, and the consequent unfaithfulness that you find in other churches, you can't find in Smyrna, you cannot find in Philadelphia. This is a church that is the church in Philadelphia, a faithful church, a pure church, a Christ-honoring church, a God-exalting church. And that's why we come to this church tonight, wanting to see what the Lord has for us in this church as a lesson for you and a lesson for me, so that we'll see what the Lord can lead us into or will lead us into. There are three points. I've divided the passage into three parts. Number one, Christ's perfection, power, and characteristics. The Lord Jesus Christ, before he gives the message to the church, he always introduces himself. And he comes to this church, to this God-exalting church, and to this Christ-honoring church. And he reveals to them his perfection, his power, his characteristic. Number two, the Christian's purity, perseverance, and consecration. The Christian's purity. Perseverance and consecration. Point number three. The concourse position as a pillar and its crown. The concourse position as a pillar and his crown. I come to point number one. Christ's perfection and power and characteristics. You see, as a Christian and as a church, the more you know Christ, the more you focus your attention on Christ, the more you know the beauty of the life of Christ, and the more you know of the power and the authority of Christ, the more confidence you have. The more confidence you have, the more conviction you have, the more courage you have, that you're able to follow the Lord, and you're able to live the life the Lord wants you to live. You're able to stay in the ministry the Lord wants you to effect without fear of any consequence at all. And listen to the Lord Jesus Christ there. This is beautiful. In Revelation chapter 3 verse 7, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, I've told you before that word angel, angelos, is a messenger of that church, is a messenger leader of that church, is a shepherd of that church, is a pastor of that church, to the angel, to the pastor, to the leader, to the messenger of the church in Philadelphia, right. This was coming from the inspired pen of John. But it was a message that came from Jesus Christ and went through John and got to the church. And it was given to the leader there so that he'll be able to give it to the congregation, to the believers. And then it's not only for that church only, because at the end of it it says, He that has ears, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. So the message is for you and for me today. How did Jesus Christ introduce himself? Look at this. These things says he that is holy and that is true. And that has the key of David that openeth, he that openeth, and no man shutteth. And shutters and no man openeth. You know, a people of God, when you understand that verse alone, you can rejoice and have a jubilee celebration over that verse, just that verse. As you look at Jesus Christ, and you see what Jesus Christ means to you and to me. First, the Lord introduced himself to the church, and he said, he is the one that is holy. Number two, he is the one that is true. Number three, he is the one that has the key of David. He has final authority. He opens a door. Nobody can shut it. Nobody can shut any door that Jesus Christ opens. No government can shut that door. No power can shut that door. No evil personality, principality can shut that door. And then when he shuts the door, there is nobody that can open that door. We'll get to that in a moment. Number one is the Holy One. He said, here is the one that is holy. Isn't it very interesting that when the angel was speaking to Mary, the Holy Ghost will come upon you and overshadow you. 
Therefore, that holy thing that shall be born of you shall be called the son of the highest. Angels called him holy. Isn't it interesting that Pilate that examined him, he said, I cannot find any fault in him. Pilate called him holy. He appeared in the synagogue. And then when the demon-possessed people saw him, they began to tremble. What have we got to do with you, thou holy one of Israel? Demons called him holy. As you look at Jesus Christ, is a holy one. It's proclaimed by angels and demons that he was holy. By men and his enemies, they knew him to be holy. They couldn't find any fault in him. That's why the Father, by the way, accepted his sacrifice, his atonement for sin. Because God Almighty found him holy, found him righteous, found him spotless, found him sinless, found him pure, found him perfect. The Father, the angels, the demons, the men, the enemies, his own disciples, they all found him to be holy. And he came to this church. And as he introduced himself, he said, I'm writing to you. I'm speaking to you. I'm sending a message to you. Who is the one talking to you? He that is holy. Number two, he that is true. Do you remember the testimony of Jesus Christ and the way, the truth and the life? Do you remember what John said about Jesus Christ? is full of grace and truth. And do you remember what the epistles said? The epistles, what they said about Jesus Christ? They say, we need to look at the truth as the truth is in Jesus. And then at the time of his trial, here comes the question. And then the question as it came, eh, what is the truth? And then Jesus said, to this end was I born. And for this cause, for this purpose, was I, did I come into the world that you should be a witness Unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Is the truth that sets us free from all sin. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Here is the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's declared to us that He's the Holy One and He's the True One. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 14. Acts 3. 14. And ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God has raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. That testifies to the life of Jesus Christ, who was holy and pure and perfect and righteous through and through. In Hebrews chapter 7, Hebrews chapter 7, reading from verse 25. Hebrews 7, 25, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Look at verse 26, for such an high priest, talking about Jesus Christ, became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. He was pure. He was holy. In Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. Reading from verse 13. Revelation 19. Reading from verse 11. And I saw heaven opened. And behold a white horse. And he that sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness does he judge and make war. Here we are told that Jesus Christ is faithful and true. And everything he does, every comment he passes, he passes every judgment he makes, he makes everything in righteousness and holiness. His eyes were like a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself, special, precious, peculiar. And then he tells us, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called, what? The Word of God. And we come back to Revelation chapter 3. In Revelation chapter 3, the Lord Jesus Christ introducing himself to this church before he brought the message to them. I told you before. 
that Jesus Christ wanted to establish to start with is credentials, is divine authority, so that the church will know is the head of the church, is the one that has authority, is the one that has the divine credentials talking unto them. So they were listening, and then it says in, in verse 7 of chapter 3, He that has the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. Look at this. Look at this. The authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, before I uh, pass comment on that, can you turn back to chapter 1 of Revelation? Chapter 1 of Revelation, verse 18. I am he that liveth and was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And it says, and I have the keys of hell and death. Think about that. It says, when I shut the gate, you cannot enter. You cannot open. And when I open it, you cannot shut it. Hey, look at Isaiah chapter 22. Isaiah chapter 22. I'm reading to you from verse 22. Isaiah 22, verse 22. And the key of the house of David, when I lay upon his shoulder, so it shall open and none shall shut. It shall shut and none shall open. You come back to Revelation chapter 3. Now you are talking about the key of David. Laid upon a shoulder. Already the angel even said he will sit upon the throne of David. He will have royal authority. Not only royal authority, he will have divine authority. Not only divine authority, he will have perfect final authority. I need to tell you tonight, brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ has final authority because he has a key in his hand. And because he has a key in his hand, when he opens, nobody can shut. Tell me, who has, he who has the key to a house has unlimited access into that house. He has unlimited authority in that house. He has unlimited hold on everything in that house. He opens the door. Nobody can close it. That means nobody has the duplicate. The only key, the final key that opens the doors of ministry and doors of opportunity is in the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. The key is not in the hand of the devil. The key is not in the hand of the government. The key is not in the hand of the powers of evil. The key is not in the hand of principalities and powers. The key is not in the hand of decision makers in the world. Tell me, when the gospel started in Jerusalem, and the Lord Jesus Christ opened the door of ministry, and we can read from the history, because they said, we'll not have this man to rule over us. He said that in the parable. And yet, the gospel covered Jerusalem. And the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, there was nothing they could do because Jesus had the key of ministry and the key of world evangelization in his hand. And when he opened the door, those Pharisees and those Sadducees and the members of the Sanhedrin, they couldn't shut the door. And then they said, we know what to do. We're going to lock them up in the prison. They locked them up in the prison. And Jesus said, you don't have the final key. I have the final key. And he sent his angel from heaven, and he opened the door and said, go stand and speak all the words of life. And then at another time, Herod took Peter again, and he locked him up in the prison. Jesus said, you have not got the lesson yet. I have the final authority. I have the key in my hand. Peter, come out of there. And then the doors opened. The iron door, without any key, opened automatically. And then came out. And eventually, in that same chapter, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 12, Herod, that had locked up Peter. Then he began to declare and make an made, uh, oration. And then he didn't, did not give the glory to God. The angel that opened the door for Peter to come out of the prison smote Herod and died. Not only that he died, immediately, not four days after, like Lazarus, and not four hours after, immediately worms came all over and ate him up and he didn't see what they were going to bury. Jesus Christ has the key of authority and the key of power. And that's the reason we have confidence in the Lord. 
Because if he sends us somewhere to minister, if he sends us somewhere to open a church, if he sends us somewhere so that there is an open door of ministry, opportunity before you as a servant of God, as a child of God, he says, I have the key, the key of authority. And when I open, there is no one that can shut that door. And that's the reason if you're a child of God, you have confidence in the Lord. You have courage in the Lord. You have the conviction that if this Jesus Christ is with you, who can hurt you? Who can harm you? What can principalities and powers do? And when God establishes you in a place, and when God sends you into a place, and he says, this is what to do. Any group of people, call them witches, call them wizards, call them herbalists, call them whatever name. Call them principalities and powers. Any kind of conspiracy or plot they have together. Wanting to stop that, they will kill themselves and hurt themselves because this is a door that the Almighty God himself has opened. Uh, there's something wonderful here now. There's something wonderful here. Listen to me. Before Jesus left, he looked at Peter and then he looked at the disciples. He said, I give unto you the keys of the kingdom of God. He had the key. And he gave it to Peter. What did Peter use the key to do? I'm sure you know your Bible. Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost came upon them. And then the key came. The key is the proclamation of the word of God. As they proclaimed the word of God, 3,000 people were converted. That's the key. It's the key to open the door of evangelization, of ministry, of opportunity. And when Jesus Christ gives that key, and he says, you can use my name, you can, I give you the power of attorney. Go and do it in my name. When you do it, nobody can say no to you. Because whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth is loosed in heaven. And then in Acts of the Apostles chapter 3, here they were coming and they saw that man lame from his mother's womb. Here is Peter and, and then here is John. And then they looked and remembered, what did we have the other time? It's the key. Because he that believeth in me, the works I do, he shall do. And greater works than these shall ye do, because I go to the Father. And then Peter said, silver and gold are by none, but don't worry about that, because we have something that is greater than silver and gold. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the man was low. He didn't understand that we have opened the door already. He was still inside there. And then Peter took him by the hand, lifted him up, and was jumping and walking and running after them. And when went into the temple in a good attitude, praising the Lord. As a result of that in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, verse 4, we're told that 5,000 people came to know the Lord. That's the key. And then in chapter 5, here we are now. And Peter, he was just, he was just going his way and was walking. And then the people that were demon-possessed and the people that were sick, they lined them up on the street. And as the shadow of Peter came on them, they were being healed. And God multiplied the church in Jerusalem greatly. And then they went to Judea. Then they went to Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. That's the key. You would have thought that the way they were fighting Christianity in the earlier years, in the early centuries, in the Middle Ages, in the dark ages, you would have thought that we wouldn't have any kind of trace of Christianity today. In the way they brought all Bibles together in some areas in Europe, and they burnt them, you will see there will be no Bible today. And in the way, atheists rose up and they challenged God and they challenged Christianity. You would have thought that there will be no Christianity, there will be no Bible, there will be no church today. But look at it today. And look at it all over Africa. See what the Lord has done. Because Jesus Christ said, I am the Holy One. I am the true one. I'm the one that has the key of David. And when I open, nobody can shut. And when I shut, nobody can open. Praise the Lord Almighty. I go to point number two. Point number two. The Christian purity, perseverance, and consecration. In Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. I'm reading to you from verse 8. I know thy works. Behold, I've set before thee an open door. Let me have an amen there. 
and no man shall shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. And there is a lot here. We don't have enough time to deal with everything. But let, let me just tell you this. It says, Behold now. Behold now. Because I, I know you. You have not denied my name. I search a door before you. And not only that, it's only a little strength you have. And don't let that bother you. Little strength. You have a little strength. As the Lord was talking to this church, he said, all you have is a little strength. But can I remind you that little is mighty when God is in it. Little is mighty, powerful, irresistible when God is in it. Have you forgotten what Jesus Christ said? That if you have faith as little, as small, as a grain of mustard seed, little is mighty when God is in it. If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you will say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be cast into the sea. And then it says, It shall obey you, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. And so they had little strength. But you see, the smallest, the least strength, if it has divine virtue inside it, is greater than the greatest of human strength. That's why, although they had little strength, because it had divine virtue inside it, because God was in that little strength, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Because of that, you have kept my word. And you have not denied my name. So don't tell me that uh, you, are, you are not able to keep the word of God because your strength is small. If that strength is small but is coming from the Lord, then you'll be able to do the will of God. Then it says in verse 9, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them come and worship before thy feet. You have gone to sleep. I'll read it again. You know, if you don't say amen in time, you are going to keep us there till midnight. If you say your amen in the appropriate place at the right time, I'm going to close in time. Which one do you want? Make your choice. I'll read it to you. Let me test you now. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan. Don't say it in the wrong way, please. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet. And to know that I have loved thee. The Lord wants me to announce to you tonight that you should know that he loves you. And that your enemies will know that he loves you. And the people of the synagogue of Satan that are trying to shut the door. When God opens that door and nobody can shut that door, they will know that Almighty God. And that Jesus Christ, that God has loved you and there's nothing they can do about it. You will taste, you will experience of the mighty love of God in your life in Jesus' name. And then he tells us in verse 10, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep you from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. That is the great tribulation that will be worldwide. The Lord will protect you from it. That is the great tribulation that will be worldwide. The Lord will protect you from it. The Lord will preserve you from it. He'll take you away from this place before it comes in Jesus' name. You know, whatever those uh, people of the synagogue of Satan, whatever they are doing, they'll come to bow before you. You will overcome them. I said you will overcome them. And that's the reason after you get out of this Congress and you go back home, you go in confidence. You go in the might of the Lord. You go in the power of the Lord. And nothing will put you on the run in Jesus' name. In Isaiah chapter 49. Isaiah chapter 49. Here is the promise of God for faithful children of God and for faithful servants of God. It says, 49, 23, Isaiah. And the king shall be thy nursing fathers. And the queen shall be thy nursing mothers. They shall bow down to thee with their face toward the earth. And they shall lick the dust of thy feet. Thou shalt know that I am the Lord. 
For they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. You will not be ashamed. You will not be ashamed. Isaiah chapter 4, chapter 60, and in verse 14. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 14. And the, the sons also of them that afflicted thee shall come bending unto thee. And all that despise thee shall bow themselves down at the soles of thy feet. They shall call thee the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. You will see then the promise that the Lord was giving to this church. This church, it appears that uh, the people of the world, the synagogue of Satan, they were thinking that they were the true people. But God said, the Lord Jesus Christ said, I am the Holy One. I'm the true one. I'm the one that has the key of David. When I open the door for you, nobody can shut that door. The Lord says, an open door before a pure church, a persevering church. And this church, because the church had kept the watch of Christ and had not denied his name, even when their adversaries and persecutors brought much pressure upon the ministers and, mini and members of the church, they still stood firm and they still stood true. Because of that, the Lord said, you have honored me, I will honor you. And I want to assure every one of you, you are honoring the Lord in your life. You are keeping the word of God, and it appears your persecutors may not understand, but you keep on honoring the Lord. Even in this life, the Lord will honor you. In your ministry, the Lord will honor you. In your community, the Lord will honor you. So he told this church, because of the honor that you have given unto me, holding unto my name, holding unto my faith, I'm going to honor you as well. You see, intense persecution had come on the church from professing religious people making false claims but this church the church uh, in um, in philadelphia this church they had remained loyal to the cause of christ the lord promised to subdue the enemies of the truth enemies of truth under faithful people he was going to prove his love for his consecrated people and for all to see and he will protect and preserve his pure people today is persevering people today from the tribulation that is still to come, that will come upon the whole world. Because you understand, the church will not partake of the great tribulation. The Lord will catch his people away. The rapture will take place, and then the righteous and the pure, the faithful and the steadfast, will be before the Lord uh, while the tribulation is going on in the world here. Point number three. In point number three, we're looking at the conqueror's position as a pillar and his crown. The conqueror's position as a pillar and his crown. That's the conqueror's crown. We're told in Revelation chapter 3, reading from verse 11, it says, Behold, I come quickly. Do you want him to come? Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast that which thou hast that no man take thy crown. Nobody will take your crown. Hold fast what you have. Even if you have a little strength, spend, use that little strength. Hold fast. Even if it appears uh, you're getting tired and your, your, your way or your steps are slow, make it steady. Hold fast. Because the Lord will soon come. You have endured for such a long time. And the Lord is saying, it will soon be over. I'm coming and I will come quickly. And as you are holding fast, then I'm, I'm preparing your crown for you. Then he said, he that overcometh, will I make a pillar in the house, in the temple of my God. He will make us pillars. That means you'll be immovable in the house of God, in the eternal temple of God. You'll be there as the pillars are steady and steadfast and eternal. So will you be in the kingdom of God, eternally in the presence of the almighty God. And then he says, and it shall go no more out that the Lord will just make you to stay, to stand in his presence forever and ever. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven uh, from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. What's the Spirit saying to the churches? The Spirit is calling every one of us to steadfastness. The Spirit of God is calling us to 
vigilant. He's saying, it's coming, it's coming. And because it's coming, you know, this is what the Lord has said repeatedly, assuring us that it's coming again. And both the Old Testament and the New Testament are full of the prophecies of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you come to the New Testament in particular, you find the promise of the rapture, that the Lord is coming to catch away the saints that are waiting, the pure, the righteous, the faithful, the real children of God, the people that are faithful and loyal and consecrated and persevering in holiness. That's why it says, hold fast. Hold fast. Hold fast that which you have, so that nobody will take your crown. What does that mean when it says hold fast? Come with me in your Bible at your First Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6. I'm reading to you from verse 20 and verse 21. You have something he has given you. And he's saying you hold it fast. You have the doctrines of the Bible. You have the name of the Lord. You have the conviction that the Lord has built up in your life. He says, hold it fast. Hold it fast. Don't let the false prophets or the circumstances of the day or what may be happening around you take it away from you. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 20. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Keep that which is committed to thy trust. He said the doctrine on the Godhead. Keep it. Hold it fast. Is it the doctrine of the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ? Hold it fast. Opinions may come. Ideologies may come. False prophets may come or the false teaching. Hold it fast. Is it on repentance that now God commands all men everywhere to repent? Hold it fast. Have you believed restitution? And then there are people today that are telling you maybe it's not mercy anymore. Maybe it's, um, you know, an extra thing that, you know, some people are just preaching. Restitution, hold it fast. Is the Lord calling you and telling you the Lord has called us unto holiness and unto uncleanness? And he has told us that it is the will of God that will be sanctified and holy and perfect. Hold it fast. Don't let some people come to you and be offering you cheap grace and tell you that we cannot be holy, we cannot be righteous today. The Lord is telling you that good thing that is committed unto you, hold it fast, number one, hold it fast for yourself, for your own soul, for your own crown, so that you will not lose your reward in eternity, number two, hold it fast for your family. Pass it on to your family. You've got it now. It's been committed into your hand. Hold it fast so much you'll be able to pass it on to your children. Number three, hold it fast for the church. We're looking up to you. The members of the church, they're looking at you. That this doctrine, this teaching, if Jesus tarries, that he has committed to your hand, you hold it fast and you back it up with your example, with your lifestyle. That's what Paul was telling Timothy, and that's what the Holy Spirit is telling every one of us here. In this, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20, oh, Timothy, and put your name there. Keep that which is committed to thy trust. Avoiding profane and vain babblings and opposition of signs falsely so-called, with some professing have erred concerning the faith. And then he tells us in 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 13 through to verse 14. Hold fast the form of sound words. Sound words. That word sound in the original means healthy. Sound, healthy. Not eaten by the canker worm of human corruption, human deception. But you hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me, in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus, that good thing. What's that? Holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. That's the good thing. That's the thing that gets you into the very presence of God, because God is of purer eyes than to behold iniquity. That good thing, which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost, which dwelleth in us. And then he tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 2, reading from verse 1, 
2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. That therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Let us say you hold fast to it and pass it from generation to generation. I don't decrease it, don't dilute it, don't adulterate it, and don't modify it, just as it was given to you. Keep the conviction strong. And that same thing, the way it was offered to you, the way it was given to you, the way, the way you were taught, give it out the same way like that. And the things that thou hast said of me, the things you have heard of me, well, Paul the Apostle is no more here. But God used uh, your pastor here to teach you the word of God. Used your pastor here to lay it line upon line, precept upon precept. I made it very clear to you in every retreat, in every workers' retreat, and in every conference and every congress like this. And what Paul told Timothy, that's what the Lord is telling me to tell you. And I'm sure you know I have the credentials, I have the right, I have the authority. And back it was my personal example to be able to tell you and counsel you in this way. That the things that you have heard of me, among many witnesses, they are the same. You will commit to faithful men. I don't commit this word of God to unfaithful people. To people, unstable people, undependable people. People that are not trustworthy. But this is what you commit to the people that are faithful. Who shall be able to teach others also? Not only that they are faithful personally in their lives, they have the ability to teach. They have the ability to pass it on. There are some wonderful people of God in our church, and I'm sure you know them in your own church. They are wonderful, they are holy, they are righteous, they are dedicated. They have real conviction, but they don't have ability to teach. You cannot pass it onto their hand. But the people that have the ability to teach, you'll pass it onto them. They'll be able to teach others also. And we come to... Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. I'm reading to you from verse 25. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 25, it says, But that which ye have already, that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. The cardinal teachings of the word of God, the basic teachings of the word of God, the convicting teachings of the word of God, you have it already, and you don't need any other addition, and you don't need any subtraction. Hold it fast. Hold it fast. Hold it fast until I come. And let me come back to this Revelation chapter 3 now before we close. Revelation chapter 3. As the Lord is challenging us and calling us to faithfulness and also challenging us that he sets a door before us. And that door is set before us when he keeps it open. Nobody can shut it. No backslider can shut it. No witch can shut it. No principalities and powers can shut it. And that door is before everyone that is faithful. A conqueror's crown awaits all believers who are faithful to the end. Those who are negligent and unfaithful will deprive themselves of eternal rewards and the promised glory. The overcomer will be made a pillar in the eternal temple of God and shall go no more out. It will be permanent. That he is that person that has made a pillar in the temple of our God. It will be permanent as part of God's spiritual temple forever and ever. What a glorious thing it will be to live a holy life, a righteous life, a victorious life, an overcoming life until the very end. Listen as I read everything to you now. It says unto the angel. Of the church in Philadelphia, right. This six is he, he who, the Christ, the son of the living God, the one that angels and men, that God himself, and even enemies of God, they declare to be holy. He that is holy, he that is true. And he that has the key of David, that's the key of authority and the key of power. 
and a key that takes the final decision. And there is no one that can reverse that final decision of the Lord. And he that openeth and no man shutteth. Would you then understand as you leave this Congress and you're going back home? And you have a conviction that the Lord himself has anointed you and appointed you and commissioned you. And he has sent you forth into that place so that you will have an open door of ministry. Will you remember any time those enemies of righteousness and the enemies of progress, any time any of those people will threaten, they are going to shut the door. If you don't change the doctrine, if you don't change your style, if you don't do this and do that, they have the authority, they have the connections, they're going to close the door. Will you remember and tell them that the key of open door of ministry is not in their hand. It's in the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when the devil comes to deceive you, that if you keep on preaching that holiness, if you keep on preaching that righteousness, if you keep on preaching that sanctification, that all these people are not going to listen, that this is not the age of holiness, this is not the dispensation of holiness, this is not the modern time of holiness, they don't want it, and therefore you are going to shut the door upon yourself if you keep on preaching holiness. Will you remind yourself and remind them that the Lord Jesus Christ opens the door of ministry to the people that are faithful, to the people that are holding fast the word of God. And know that while you keep on preaching the word of righteousness and Christian holiness, nobody can shut that door. All you need to do is consecrate yourself, commit yourself, lay everything upon the altar, and it says, I'm the one that is holy and the one that is true. Be faithful unto me to the very end, and I open the door before you, and nobody can shut it. And brothers and sisters, can I tell you that in your local church, in deeper life, if you are living a righteous life, and you are standing by the doctrines of the word of God, there may be some people in your local church, they don't like the firm, strong stand that you take on righteousness. And they can gang up together. And he can come to talk to you and say, Pastor, this holiness, righteousness, consecration, conviction, fiery kind of zeal, passion, and evangelism is too much. Our people here, that's not what we want. And if you don't bend and bow to us here, we people here, we have the power. We have the method, we have the strategy to gang together and get you out of this place where you stand at such a time and let them know that there is no man, no woman, that there is no gang, no group of people that can shut the door that Jesus Christ has opened. Am I right? Will you go with that conviction out of this Congress and let the people know that you are serving the Lord Jesus Christ and that you are answerable to him, you are not answerable to them. And that Jesus Christ who appointed you, he has a final authority and he has a key in his hand. And when he opens the door, nobody can shut that door. And that's, that's the confidence your pastor here that he has. Since we started 1973, it's going to get to 30 years now, this August. And between 1973 and this time, we've seen much water pass under the bridge. And we've seen some people that are so bold and direct. They didn't even write an anonymous letter. They came directly to me, and they revealed who they were. And I remember that individual that told me, I can remember the exact place now, and I can remember the way he spoke, and he pointed at me and told me directly and said, if you keep on preaching this holiness, this righteousness, that time we only had the church in Lagos, just Bible study group. We had not even started Sunday worship. And we had not covered the whole of Nigeria. We had not gone to Ghana. 
I will not gone to many countries in Africa, but he told me, if you keep on preaching this holiness and sanctification, that I'm telling you that in a few years, everything will fold up. Nobody wants to listen again. And then he told me what I ought to preach. One false doctrine. Coming from one false prophet somewhere. And I looked at him and I said, that's what you said. That if Jesus tarries many, many years to come, you'll still find me standing on this same word. I remember the name of that individual now, and he had a ministry in Lagos there. That ministry has folded up himself. He's forgotten. Nobody even knows him now. Even if I mention his name, nobody here will recognize him. It's gone. It's folded up. But the open door is still before me here. In Nigeria, the open door is there. In Ghana, the open door is there. In French-speaking countries, the open door is there. The open door is still there because I didn't open that door. You didn't open that door. You can't close that door. Jesus Christ, the Son of God and the Son of David, with royal authority, with royal power, he has that key in his hand. He has kept that door open. Be faithful to the word of God. You have an example here. You have a mentor here. You have a leader here. Nothing you can go through that have not gone through. And the open door is still there. You go back to your village. You go back to your town. You go back to the location where you came from. And any time you face any challenge, you face any mountain, you face any problem. And the devil is trying to tell you that the door is going to be shut. Turn your mind back to the headquarters in Lagos here. Remember, you have a man here that by the grace of God, the people threatened that they were going to close the door. But thank God Almighty, the door is still open today. And if you will be faithful to the Lord, the door will be open before you. I said the door will be open before you. Rise up and tell the Lord and say, Lord, I will be faithful. I will be faithful. And you'll keep the door of ministry and the door of opportunity open before me. I'm going to serve you to the very end. No man can close the door. No witch can close the door. No woman can close the door. No abalist can close the door. No traditional man can close the door. No country can close the door. The key is in the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be faithful. Be faithful. Be faithful. Be faithful. Don't let any backslider run you out of the ministry. Be faithful to the Lord. Don't let any threatening witch or wizard run you out of the ministry. Be faithful to the Lord. He says, I have the key. And I keep the door open. No principality or power. And no evil person, no backslider can close that door, shut that door. Be faithful, be faithful, be faithful. Be faithful to the very end. Any door that anybody opens for you, if the Lord has not opened it, it can be closed. Any door that any friend opens for you, if the Lord has not opened it, it can be shut. But when the Lord Jesus Christ... The amen and the faithful and the true one and the holy one, when he opens the door with that final key of authority, nobody can close that door. Hold fast. Hold fast. Hold fast to the doctrines of the word of God. The doctrine of repentance, hold it fast. The doctrine of restitution, hold it fast. The doctrine of one man, one wife, hold it fast. And that doctrine of holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, hold it fast. The Lord is watching you. The Lord is watching you. The Lord is watching you. As you hold it fast, then the Lord will keep the door of ministry open before you. And no man will be able to shut that ministry. All that the Lord has committed into your hand, hold it fast. Hold it fast. Hold it fast. Don't allow any group of people to threaten you. We're going to close the door of ministry for you. They cannot do it. They cannot do it. They cannot do it. They cannot do it. You just be faithful. Faithful, faithful to the very end. You have a little strength, but little is mighty when God is in it. Little is mighty when God is in it. Then you will not deny the name of the Lord. With oh, that little strength I can do. All things through Christ 
who strengthens me. I can do all things. I can do all things. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Keep on standing. Keep on standing. Keep on standing. Don't bend or bow to any threatening power, to any synagogue of Satan. They will come to bow before you. There's assurance. There's a promise of the Lord. There's a word of the Lord for you. They will bow before you. They will bend before you. Don't bow to any contrary power. You bend your knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only one you are going to worship. All the other personalities and powers will come and bend and bow before you. Make up your mind. Dedicate yourself to the Lord. You'll be submissive to the Holy Spirit and to the word of the Lord. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. It's only those people that are committed to the Lord, consecrated to the Lord, and you are keeping what the Lord has given you. It's only those people that the Lord will keep the door of ministry open before them. Commit yourself to the Lord. And commit yourself to the teaching of the unchanging, infallible word of God. Don't change it. Don't adulterate it. Don't subtract from it. Don't add to it. Keep to the word. Keep to the word. And keep to the word. And that key in the hand of Jesus will be used to open the door of ministry, door of opportunity before you, and no man will be able to close that door. Commit yourself to the Lord. Commit yourself to the Lord. It's your commitment and consecration. Your steadfastness. That will make the Lord to keep that door of ministry, that door of opportunity, open for you and remain open. Hold fast what you have. Don't let anyone take your crown. an